Catholic Martyrs of the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, A Catholic Holocaust, by Fray Justo Perez de Urbel. Chapter 19, Shepherd of Wolves. We turn now to those who oppose the fortress of Catholicism and the savagery of its most bitter enemies. Don Romualdo Fuensanta was a man in every sense of the word. He lived and practiced his legal profession in the busy town of Sama de Langreo in Asturias. There are still in this town today numerous witnesses to his irreproachable conduct, his manners, his continual concern for the poor, and his innate passion for justice. His cousin was the parish priest of a nearby village who had been murdered in the early days of the Red Domination. A little later, Don Romualdo was imprisoned on the ridiculous charge of being the cousin of a murdered priest. During his first days in prison, authority and a certain amount of order and normal procedure were maintained. So Don Romualdo did not suffer the usual harsh treatment at the hands of the Red Militia, but that was only at the beginning. Later, and without any transitional period, and not even without any reason for the change, his sufferings began and continued at length, getting worse all the time, culminating in his frightful death one winter in the mountains. There is a valuable document which gives us a moral profile of Don Romualdo. This letter is from a client of his legal practice and reads as follows. And so I tell you, I am not too worried. I am confident that, in the end, we shall not see ourselves engulfed in misery. Besides, there is Don Romualdo. I have never seen such a wonderful man. Indeed, we have been very fortunate in this respect. Not only did he fulfill his duty, but went beyond his bare obligations. We were like his own family. Besides, he was tiredless. It even seemed that he took more interest than I did myself. And he knows we are poor, that I shall not be able to pay him until goodness knows when, if ever. The letter continues. But these few lines give an impression of the spiritual caliber of the future martyr. What was Don Romualdo's life like in prison? When the thugs began to direct their ill humor at him and make him the object of injuries and blows, his response was always absolute humility. He followed the eternal example of Christ. One day, when they asked him why he wanted to have nothing to do with them, Don Romualdo replied, You are wrong. I do want to communicate with you. I would like justice and order to obtain among you if there was any hope in that dream. But the sad fact is that there is not. Why not? They replied. That's exactly what we do want, justice. Oh, yes? He was a priest who deceived the village. He was a priest who did a great deal of good in the village, spiritually and materially. And what you did, mark this well, was not an act of justice, but a murder. The only reply was a beating. At the end of the day, the elaborate arguments of the Reds culminated in a bashing. They changed his cell. It was a wretched little hole, little more than a cupboard, without any window. It was completely dark inside, and no furniture, not a chair, not even the usual bed, nothing, completely empty. At night, a militia opened the door of that nightmarish cell and went in. He carried a candle to see by. He also had a large bucket of water, the purpose of which was shortly to be revealed. Friend, said the militia, I've got a job for you. And at once, without another word, he threw the water on the floor of the cell. It was the beginning of winter. It is not difficult to imagine what sort of night Don Romualdo had thrown into that tiny prison with a flooded floor, unable not only to lie down or sit down, but even to stay standing because of the swamp, you can imagine what he went through. The next morning, the same militia as the night before opened the door again and asked, laughing, How did you sleep? No answer? Well, well, here are some gentlemen come to ask you some questions. The gentlemen were his murderers.
Besides which, the gentlemen were drunk. Look, they said, at least you can wash yourself now, like you've never washed yourself before in your life. Don Romualdo answered, Is this what you call justice? Not even the savages would do this. Only you are untouched by the hand of God. Stop that nonsense. Listen, son, if you will go down on your knees, say that you have had a very profitable night and that dead priests are better than live ones, you can go off home right now. I can't tell a falsehood, and I can't give you that answer. You're criminals. Right. Well, don't say we didn't warn you. You're a fool, and you'll be sorry for it, but it will be too late then. And with nothing more, they went off, leaving him shut up, soaking wet, sleepless and exhausted. They came back that night. Are you coming over to us or not? You'd better not ask me. No. They threw in another bucket of water and went off. This martyrdom, a genuine, slow, diabolical martyrdom, lasted three days, no less. Eventually, Don Romualdo showed signs of going mad. They took the madman, as they called him now, out of that cell and back to his previous cell. The following week, they paraded him out of the prison and forced him to take his clothes off. In this fashion, they paraded him through the village with a poster tied on to his back, declaring in large letter, Death to the Priests. Naked, in the middle of the street, with a temperature four degrees below zero, Ill, weakened by the very treatment he had received, ferociously injured, he was the model of a man personifying red justice. And the justification for this act of justice was that the accused stoutly maintained his opinion. But not a political opinion, no. He confined himself to belief in God and disapproval of the behavior of those who passionately hated God. Indeed, the matter is grotesque, but at this distance nothing can surprise us. We know only too well who we are dealing with, and that their bombastic manner of proclaiming justice is no more than a tragedy. In spite of everything, the martyrdom of the good lawyer went on. There was no shortage of blows, although there was certainly a shortage or total absence of food. Putrid food that even the pigs would have rejected. The militia paid frequent visits to the cell of Don Romualdo. They pinched him and kicked him. They pushed him from one side to the other. They made fun of him. They squeezed his throat until he nearly suffocated. Don Romualdo knew that eventually, sooner or later, they would kill him, assuming he did not die of exhaustion. And his only refuge was prayer. He gave himself up to this completely. Whole days were one long conversation with God, a great source of strength to him. Otherwise, he would have never endured for a whole month the three or four beatings a day, the hunger, and the endless ill treatment. Suddenly, the militia changed their tactics. Don Romualdo suffered a dangerous wound in his leg as a result of a blow from a bayonet. That wound caused him immense suffering. Then, without any explanation, they took him to one of the best houses in the village, the main red headquarters, and installed him in a spacious clean room on a clean bed. They brought him tasty food and wine and arranged for a doctor to attend to his leg wound and take care of him. Don Romualdo was at a loss as to the reason for this sudden and inexplicable change. Then light dawned. It became too clear. Something was going to happen. We hope you have no complaints about our justice. You should have not made a martyr of me. Even supposing I had offended against your laws, you had no right to make a martyr of me. Well, well, have it your way. Anyway, you can't complain now. I would like to know the reason for this change. Obviously, you want something from me. You're quite right, friend. And we thought you were silly. Well, tell me, what do you want? Wait for it, you'll soon know. After another ten minutes, a militia comes into the room, apparently superior to the others, and whom Don Romualdo had not seen before. He was dressed in a new blue overall, or nearly new, and his straps and cartridge belts shined like 
he did himself, and in general, he looked quite pleasant. Don Romualdo thought he must be a person of some education, and his hopes of freedom rose, albeit cautiously. And he might well be cautious. He was accompanied by a couple of bodyguards of truly ferocious appearance, unshaven, disheveled hair, and armed to the teeth with revolvers, knives, and grenades. The visitor studied the wounded man for several seconds before deciding to speak. Eventually, he said, you have a cousin who is a priest. Don Romualdo was astonished by this treatment, although there was a certain discretion and subtlety about the question. He replied confidently, yes, sir. Although we cannot return him to life, the matter has been sorted out, and I tell you this for your own personal satisfaction. I don't know what you're trying to say. It's easy. You will see. Usually the priests have obstructed our revolution, and it is not surprising that once the revolution is successful, they will have to pay the consequences. It's the law of war. I don't entirely agree with you. If you would allow me to explain, don't, brother. I tell you the matter has been sorted out. I am referring simply to the matter of your cousin. He was innocent. He loved the people, and his death can only be explained by the usual confusion in the early days. Allow me to say anyway that nearly all, if not all, the priests are innocent. This is not the time for discussion. As you wish, nevertheless, I thank you for acknowledging the innocence of my cousin, albeit a little late in the day. Right then. Now, I want to ask you something. Don Romualdo put himself on guard. Provided you can agree, then other matters could be sorted out as well. Mine, for example? It's possible, it's possible, yours, for example. Tell me, you are a lawyer. You know the district perfectly. If I am not mistaken, you have traveled the area many times, sometimes daily. In fact, I know my region very well. Briefly, it is a question of your coming over to us. In a day or so, you can pay visits to several villages. Others will take more time. There are people here who know the villages better than I do. The fact is that you have another great advantage. You are a very educated man. This makes it easier for you to size up the situation at a glance and not be missled by appearances. So simply... You want me to become a spy. I suggest that you help us. I have nothing more to say. If you accept, we will go more deeply into the matter and sort out the details. You know how the land lies. If you refuse, well, I don't think you're in a position to play fast and loose. I refuse. Full stop. The interviewer, no doubt a cultivated and intelligent man, realized at once that neither bribes nor threats would influence the prisoner. Without another word, accompanied by his thugs, he left the room. The next day, Don Romualdo was put back in the prison. Once back, he became martyr material again. That is not to say that the fury of the militia increased, but it all became more violent and miserable, if indeed there were any more degrees of violence and misery. Don Romualdo kept up his continuing prayer. More than once, the other prisoners heard him shut out while his jailers were beating him. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. Following a heavy snowfall, they took him to the neighboring mountains, full of steep and dangerous precipices, very difficult to cross. On reaching a pass, they said to him, Prepare to die. I will pray to God for you. You have no idea how much you need it. He fell seriously wounded by two shots. One went through a thigh, and the other broke a collarbone, causing great damage. Wounded as he was, they tied him to a tree on the lonely mountain, and that night he was eaten alive by wolves. This was a terrible end for Don Romualdo, an honorable man and a friend of the humble. He died a witness to his honor, and God gave him the strength to keep going to the last moment without giving in to either the violence or the more dangerous blandishments. And so was created another martyr in the great Spanish army.